Hello and welcome everyone. We are on day two of the 2020 UC Master Gardener virtual conference. Thank you for joining us. We have about 144 people so far logging on, Kevin. This is amazing. You've got people all into the compost or maybe not into compost and wanting to get into compost. If, if that's the case, welcome, you're in the right place. So uh, if you guys wanna drop in the comment section uh, how much you love compost or what you're here to learn today, that would be great. Uh, it's been so much fun um, yesterday learning about houseplants and someone at our houseplant talk, Kevin said, can I put compost in my houseplant? And we were like, I mean, you can to a certain tolerance level. I mean, it's just, it's your house plant. So you're gonna bring compost inside. But I was like, this is the perfect segue people. We're ending with house plants uh, yesterday and we're starting with a compost today. So it felt so, so natural to just be all about the soil and all about the love that we can give our soil health or improve our soil health with compost. So we're very excited to have you here today. Uh, Kevin, where are you joining us from? Um, are you home? Are you, where are you at today? I am actually in our Nevada County office in Grass Valley. Um, and I haven't been in this office for quite a while. So it's kind of oddly nice to be back in the office. <laughs> Um, Kevin, I'm right down the hill from you, except I'm in the home office. I am in uh, uh, Sutter County, and uh, I'm chilling in my home office uh, with my pumpkins that I harvested and grew, so very, very happy for that. Um, that's one good thing that's come out of COVID is that I actually planted my pumpkins on time, so that's a positive. <laughs> and uh, if you see every once in a while, my dog may come in and just look at the screen just to make loving eye contact with you. So he's really <laughs> into seeing people on screen lately or just listening to voices. So we're definitely very, okay very- with that. I'm no, definitely perfect. a dog lover. <laughs> he's, he's, he's one of my new coworkers. It's, it's real nice. All right, um, so we got lots of comments coming in about where people are from. We have San Mateo, we have, um, oh, you have a fan. You have someone named Kurt going, go Kevin. And Kurt is from Thank Plaster you. County. <laughs> um, Thanks, Kurt. So uh, we have Fremont, California, Sacramento County, San Joaquin County. We've got people from everywhere. San Diego, San Jose, Santa Clara, Mariposa, Loomis, Placer County. We got some Placer County folks logging in. This is nice. We got some Northern California, middle of the state, and Southern. I love it. We have Napa Good. County, El Dorado. All right. Oh, Marcy Souza says, Hi, Kevin and Lauren. San Joaquin County's here. Hi, Marcy. Thanks for coming and joining us today. Marcy spoke yesterday, so we're very happy to have her come join us today as a guest. Thank you, Marcy. All right, Kevin, I'm going to pass it over to you. Please introduce yourself and um, just welcome to the virtual conference. All right. Well, thank you, number one, for inviting me to do this. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much obsessed with composting. I always say I have OCD, <laughs> obsessive composting disorder. Um, so this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So um, I'll introduce myself, Kevin Marini. I am a master gardener coordinator for two counties in the foothills, Placer County and Nevada County. So I have two master gardener programs that I oversee. Um, and I've been working in this manner for almost 18 years now, so quite a while. Um, and composting has, even from the very beginning, has always kind of been my niche um, and I, like I said, I'm obsessed with it personally, but I also just really enjoy teaching about composting. And I'm hoping today, it, if just one person watching today starts composting, this will have been a great success because that's kind of my goal is to break down any barriers to composting so that people feel comfortable giving it a shot. And once they do and have success, then it becomes just part of your life, right? Um, so that's my hope. So today we're gonna to talk about composting for soil health while turning waste into a resource. And I know that's kind of a cliche thing to say, waste into a resource, but it's true that we really need to change the way that we look at organic materials as waste. We need to change that and look at them as a resource for us to utilize. Um, so let's get going and 
Lauren will let me know if for some reason there's any technical difficulties, but it's, it's looking really great, true. Kevin. And you know okay. what? I did, I did forget to say we are willing to take questions throughout the presentation. So if you have something and want to pop it in the comments, um, I'll, I'll try and pull those out for Kevin and, um, and ask him verbally so we can all, all, all get a great answer. All right. All you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so a lot of master gardeners that maybe have heard me um, talk about composting know that I usually start the classes with, you know, why we should even be considering composting, right? Um, now for gardeners, it's pretty clear why you would want to consider composting because you can create a soil amendment that is going to make your gardens better. So of course, most gardeners are, are for it. But there's other reasons as well. Um, so obviously, from the soil health perspective, um, there is plenty of research out there supporting the use of compost in our gardens to increase the organic matter percentage in our soils. So if you look at that little graph to the right, air 25%, water 25%, mineral particles 45%, and you see that little sliver 5% of organic matter. Organic matter may not make up an enormous part of the soil, but it's crucial that we have it in there and we can add compost to the soil to increase that percentage. We're adding soil biology, we're adding nutrients that are available and become available over time for the plants. Um, we are making our soils um, you know, more aerated, they're able to hold more oxygen, they're able to drain better, um, so as far as soil health goes, it's, it's really a no brainer. There's tons of research backing it up that adding compost, um, into your soil is a good thing. And even better if you make it at home, um, because we use at home a, a diversity of inputs in our compost pile, which usually means that the end product that comes out is also quite diverse and, and really good. Um, so you can make a great compost in your own backyards. Okay. So that's in my you know, opinion, probably the number one reason to compost if you're a gardener. Now, there's also just the wow factor, okay? I literally, the first time I experienced the transformation of organic materials to compost, I, I was astonished. I, I'm using that word on purpose because I couldn't believe the fact that in such a small amount of time, those materials went from raw to this finished compost state. Um, I think if you've never really truly experienced that, when you do, there literally is a wow factor. Like, this is amazing. This is what nature does and we can help it along and, and take advantage of this process. So um, you can see me in that picture on, on the bottom right there, you know, I'm smiling, but you don't need, I'm, I'm ecstatic. You look very happy. Like, <laughs> it's like, very, that's, my happy. Happy okay, that's my happy place. Um, okay, so obviously there's a, this other factor, this other reason to compost that has to do with environmental impact. And this is on lots of different levels. Um, so I'm actually going to go to the next slide and um, talk about environmental impact in relation to this slide. So this is from Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. And this slide shows roughly almost 60 years of our municipal solid waste management in the United States, okay? And the gray area at the bottom is the landfill, amount of, amount of tons that we put in a landfill. There's a blue stripe um, that is, what, the blue stripe, actually, I can't see what that is right now. Um, do you, can you see what that is? Um, the, the dark blue stripe? Not the dark blue, the light blue in the middle. Um, combustion dark with blue. energy recovery. Energy. Okay. Okay. Just, I, I have something um, <laughs> blocking it down at the bottom on my screen. And then the middle yellow is the composting. And then the recycling is a dark blue at the top. So what's interesting about this um, graphic is it shows that our overall waste stream, how much we throw away in the United States of America has increased over these over this time period. But the increase we've kind of dealt with in recycling, composting, and energy transformation, okay? If you look almost 1980 to present, even though this only goes to 2017, our, the amount we have put buried in landfills in the United States has roughly remained the same. Almost 140 million tons a year 
go into our landfills all across the nation. So, so from an environmental impact perspective, the more that we can increase that yellow band and decrease the gray area, the better because as we bury organic materials in our landfills, it creates problems for us, okay? And so what kind of problems? Well, there's methane gas production that occurs from the anaerobic decomposition of organic materials in a landfill. There is leachate that goes through a landfill that we have to capture and treat as, as hazardous waste, okay? Um, if we didn't, put these organic materials in our landfills, we wouldn't have those two problems. Also, just the amount of volume that the organic materials take up in our landfill. So it's estimated about 40% of that gray area, okay, is organic and can be composted. So we can almost cut that gray area in half if we stop sending and burying organic materials in our landfill. So to me, that's an enormous environmental impact considering our levels are haven't really budged in a very, very long time. Kevin, so, that, that alone inspired me to try again at composting. Thank you. Yes, good. I thought it was a, <laughs> it's a pretty powerful graphic. No it doubt. is. Yeah. Okay, m moving on. So what is compost? Well, the University of California has this amazing definition. I'm just going to read it straight up. Compost is the biologically active material that results from microbial decomposition of organic matter under controlled conditions. Whew. Now, when I teach composting to my master gardener volunteers, I tell them, I read this, and then I tell them to immediately forget it. Because compost, if you, if you just go by this definition, it sounds very complicated. It sounds a little intimidating. When we all know if we've composted before that, it just happens, right? So it doesn't need to be so complicated, okay? And that's kind of the goal of my talk today is to kind of demystify it and give different real practical systems that you can choose from um, to make it work for you, okay? Now, the, I underline controlled conditions on purpose because decomposition is happening all the time in nature. Right now, we're all, um, you know, together here but outside um, decomposition is happening and it happens with or without us, okay? So remove human beings, decomposition still happens, right? So composting is a little bit different. Composting is, is human beings getting involved and controlling the conditions of decomposition. So, so composting is kind of a specific human practice, if you will, even though it involves a natural process of decomposition. So that's important as we move forward to remember that. Okay? And remember, compost happens. So I like to think of a compost pile as an ecosystem, meaning that there's all these interrelated parts. And in a sense, they're all feeding off each other, Okay, literally in this case. Um, so all those critters that you see in the bottom right graphic, which I know it's kind of hard to see, but basically from bacteria and fungi and actinomycetes at the bottom and moving up to you know, larger macroorganisms. There's all of these critters and they're all in our compost piles and they're all eating the actual organic materials and eating each other. And that process um, has a goal. And the goal is to decompose the raw organic materials into stable humus over time, okay? So number one, humus, not hummus. That's important, right? Only one M in humus, two M's in hummus. And I've heard okay. many times <laughs> in compost classes, people talking about making great hummus. And I'm like, ah, no, not hummus. Um, that must be confusing to some people. Anyway, so um, to from the from the point where an organic raw organic material turns into stable humus, that is a long time. Okay. So this is a process that takes time. Okay, and we can um, mix our compost piles in a way or, or treat them in a way to make that time shorter. Or if we don't want to put in the effort, we can allow it to take more time and it's not a big deal, but it will still eventually happen, right? It still eventually decomposes at some point, right? Okay, so we need to, right off the bat, 
determine how to make sense of the organic materials we have, right? So whoever you are, you have these either organic materials coming from your yard or from your household, right? And so in general, in all the composting literature that you may read, you'll find that it's kind of agreed upon to divide these organic materials into two groups. One being the carbon materials, also known as browns, and then the nitrogen materials being greens. And so for a lot of people who have tried composting, this is very self-explanatory. They, they could tell you right now what a brown is, what a green is. But in my experience, giving a lot of public talks over the years, this seems to be a hang up for a lot of people. How do I know if this is a green or a brown? So just so everyone is aware, every single organic material um, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio, okay? And so if you're a, a compost operator at a municipal composting um, situation, you're really uh, being very technical about these carbon to nitrogen ratios of all the materials and how you're mixing them. So you could go on the internet and you can look up anything and, and put carbon to nitrogen ratio after it and you have an idea of it's out there. There's lists of materials with their carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so that can help you determine what's a brown and what's a green because high carbon to nitrogen ratios are browns and low carbon to nitrogen ratios are greens. But you don't even have to worry about that because there's just lists of greens and browns. So you go on the internet and put in the material like eggshells, green or brown, and I can almost guarantee you, you're going to get some information. Of course, you want to try and always choose a .edu site to get that information from um, so that you know it's reliable. But the amount of work that has gone in to create these lists of organic materials and whether they fall into a brown or green category, it's, it's extensive. So you won't have any trouble finding that out. So first, let's focus on the browns. These are carbon-rich materials. Usually, uh, you know, they're dried out, very low moisture, very lightweight. Um, and I, they are commonly colored brown, but you can't really go by colors when you're talking about browns and greens. It just so happens that a lot of brown material actually colored brown. Um, but for example, there's a brown material animal manure that is firmly in the green category and not a brown. So that's why you can't really go by color. So a carbon or brown material, some examples dry leaves, right? I'm gonna about to have plenty of those available. Um, dried out straw, um, sawdust from dried out wood, dried out wood chips, um, all of our dried out dead plants, to be honest with you. All those would be in the brown category. There's a few that are um, a little odd that aren't listed here, and that is newspaper and cardboard. So if you uh, you know, we're wanting to build a compost pile and you didn't have any browns, you could even just use, you know, newspaper and cardboard for that, that brown group. Okay. And hey, Kev hey I, Kevin, yeah, sure. uh, thanks. Thanks for bringing up. We have, we have a few comments going on and I'm glad you said brown doesn't mean necessarily color. We have someone who asked coffee grounds, brown question mark. So mm -hmm. like, and then someone replied in the comments, um, coffee grounds are green, ironically. <laughs> like, yeah. So you're right. So you, we can't always say brown is brown. Like brown refers to other things than just color. So that's a great reminder. Yeah. And I think that's why it can get really confusing for the public when I, when they read about this, they're going, well, why are they using greens and browns if there's, if it's not based on color? Well, it's just the way, you know, it's the, the jargon has developed over time. So it's really, really important if you're talking about a backyard compost pile, whether we're talking about a hot pile or a cold pile, and we're going to get into that in a second, you want browns and greens. So the reason I'm going over this is so everyone understands what is a brown and what is a green, and that they understand you need both. A compost pile just of browns or just of greens is a failed compost pile. <laughs> now, does that mean that those two situations won't eventually break down and decompose? Of course they will. But there will be 
it will take a heck of a lot of time and there will be issues. So when I am talking about backyard composting, I'm talking about browns and greens together. So that's important. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, so moving on now to the greens. So that these are high nitrogen materials um, and they really get the, the, the heat started in the pile. And, you know, as opposed to the browns, these are full of moisture. They're relatively fresh in a way. They haven't been... Um, you know, the browns have been dead for a while, right? So grass clippings is a good example. You can mow your lawn, you have fresh grass clippings. But as they, you know, age, they turn into a brown as they lose their moisture and lose their nitrogen, right? So grass clippings, fresh are green, but dried out are brown. Um, so coffee grounds, like was just mentioned, firmly in the green category still has some nitrogen in there. Animal manures. So, you know, your horse manure and chicken manure and cow manure and rabbit manure. Now, when it comes to animal manures, there's actually a spectrum of carbon to nitrogen ratios, meaning that you may have heard of like hot manure versus cold manure. So a lot of people think of chicken poop as very hot and cow poop as very cold. And that has to do with their nitrogen contents. And it is true that, that, you know, chicken manure is hot in that sense. So be aware that manure is, is representing a spectrum of materials. Um, alfalfa hay is a weird one that I, I put this on here on, on purpose so that I talk about it because it's one of those ones that, um, you know, it gets, it gets dried out so quickly that it maintains its green color even though it's kind of dry to the touch and so a lot of people think well it's dry it should be a brown but it's colored green so what does that mean well there it's considered more of a green material than a brown material even though a lot of the moisture has been lost so that's one of those weird um, materials okay so like i said this is just in general to determine what's a brown, what's a green, and you need both as we move forward to talk about compost, okay? Kevin, can I ask so, you some green questions? Of course. Um, we have Nancy okay. who wants to know, what about just burying my green compost to build up the soil? Well, that is a great question, and I didn't pay her to ask that, but it is, <laughs> I will specifically be talking about that coming up. So be patient and you will, um, I will definitely talk about that. Okay. okay. Uh, how about, um, here's a good one. How terrible for the, how terrible is it for the process if acorns get in with the leaves? Well, I mean, again, acorns, you know, are organic material. So they're going to break down over time. It's just that they also might sprout. <laughs> in yeah. Your compost pile. Um, and so, you know, depending on, you're going to see here, that we're going to talk about hot composting and cold composting. And, you know, in hot compost, it's very possible that those acorns would decompose very quickly and not pose a problem whatsoever. Whereas in a cold compost, they could sprout and potentially grow and put out roots and, and, and really, um, well, not necessarily slow down the process, but interrupt it, let's put it that way. And everyone's favorite topic, Kevin, poop. Um, are you yeah. going to talk about different types of manures later, or would you like to talk about poop now? <laughs> well, I, I don't want to, if I go off on that tangent, I mean, I literally teach a class on animal poop. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, I have to be careful not to get you know derailed and going off on that tangent. But basically, when it comes to animal manures, um, our, our philosophy here at, at UC uh, is to compost all animal manure. So there's a lot of folks that have llamas, alpacas, or, or, or rabbits. And on the internet, you'll, you'll see that a lot of people will say those types of animal manures can be directly added to soil. So as the University of California Master Gardener Program representative, I'm saying our philosophy is compost all animal manure before adding the finished compost to your soil. So we don't recommend adding fresh manure of any animal directly to the soil. I know that's been a common practice in the past, but I'm just kind of towing the line there and saying that's our, our uh, recommendation. Um, and so, you know, 
again, if you have questions about anim animal manures, maybe we can get to them at the end, or you can contact me, my contact information at the very end and ask me specific questions because I'll, that'll take me off on a tangent. I'll start talking about poop for an hour. <laughs> All right. Um, because we did have a question on dog and cat poop. So people are chatting with each other in the comments on whether dog and cat poop's appropriate. So yeah. And I have a list coming up here that has okay. what you don't put in your compost piles and dog and cat poop are on that list. So okay. we don't re recommend putting those in there, but I'll talk more about that in a sec. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, sure. Okay. Moving on. So I think the most important thing is for every person who is each situation is different. So every person that is listening to this needs to think to themselves, what is my goal with composting? Okay. Am I a avid gardener that requires a lot of compost all the time? You know, say you're a four season vegetable gardener and you need a lot of compost and you need a lot. So your goal is actually the production of compost, right? Whereas say somebody who lives um, in an apartment building, right? And just has a balcony and has a few little containers out there. Their, their goal isn't <laughs> compost production. Their goal may just be, I want to recycle all my organic materials so I don't send them to the land. Right. So in their in that sense, maybe their goal is waste recycling and not so much compost production. So they would have a different composting system. And obviously, just by the nature of them living in an apartment with only a balcony. But the point is that you you shouldn't go out and buy a composting system before you think about what your goal is and how much organic materials do you produce so you know let's say you're a family of three and you eat a little bit of vegetables that's very different than if you're a family of eight and you are all vegetarian <laughs> so the amount of material that's produced from your food choices as well as your yard situation will be a factor in determining what system is going to work best for you okay so you have to put some thought into this up front um, because there may be a better system for your situation okay and this as you can see in the picture that's one of my master gardeners who's i know she's thinking to herself is this the best system that we could have for this right so how do we figure out which one we should use so you're going to think about your goals um, and then we're going to learn about these different systems that I've listed here. Hot composting, cold composting, worm composting, bokashi composting, and trench composting, which is what that question um, that was raised is, is referring to, burying organic materials. So here we go. You ready? Start ready. right now. So hot composting. In my experience, 18 years of teaching composting, everybody loves to learn about hot composting. They want to do hot composting, but in my experience, it is probably maybe 10%, if that, of all the different um, people that I've talked to that are doing composting. The overwhelming majority of people that I've talked to do cold composting as opposed to hot composting, okay? So why is that? Well, it probably has to do with your goals, okay? So let's talk about this. When would you have a goal that would force your hand to do hot composting? Number one, you would have a large volume of organic materials. So for example, I live on seven acres and there's a lot of organic material of yard waste produced from that much land, right? Um, not to mention the fact that I have a neighbor with horses, I have a bunny, I have food scraps from my house, right? So you add that all together and it's like, wow, that's a lot of organic materials. And so in order to process that quickly, man, I need to have a hot compost pile so that it happens, turns the compost quickly, right? It just so happens that I'm also an avid gardener. So I also want a lot of compost for my garden. So hot composting is kind of a no-brainer for someone like me because I want a lot of compost and I have a lot of material to turn into that compost. And this is probably the most efficient way to do so, 
okay? So that would be a good reason to try your hand at hot composting, okay? Um, when I first started composting, I was in this group of, of people. We were doing education in schools and building compost piles, and we kind of had this co whole competition thing going on about who could get a, the co a compost pile the hottest, you know? We didn't know at that time that you could actually get it too hot and it could be a problem. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, even though there is maybe an instinctual urge to, oh, I really want to see that steam coming off my compost pile and take its temperature and have heat, hot compost, it may not be necessary for you to do this, okay? So let's talk about if you're going to do hot composting, what you would do. Number one, you have to have enough greens and enough browns to create a pile that has the volume at the very, very least of three feet by three feet by three feet. So what that means is you can't do hot composting in a shoebox, right? It, you don't, you need a certain volume of material to host enough microorganisms that leads to high temperatures. And you can't get that unless you have a certain size to your pile. And a lot of the commercial compost bins that you would pay hundreds of dollars for um, aren't even that size. They can't even really make hot compost. So um, that's really important, first off, is you have to have enough material. Now, that material ideally should be cut up, should be shredded in some way, shape, or form. So that's a big part, a big factor in how fast compost happens, okay? So as much as you can chop up that material, the faster you're going to get to your finished product. Now, hot composting is, and we teach hot composting here at UCMG, um, University of California Master Gardener Program, as an aerobic process. So we do not want your pile to go anaerobic, meaning that there's no oxygen, because anaerobic conditions in a backyard compost pile leads to odors, okay? So a lot of people think, I don't compost because it stinks. Well, the only reason it would be stinking is because something's wrong, okay? If you're doing composting correctly, um, the odor is minimal, to be honest, and I would, <laughs> I'm OCD, so I, I would actually say it smells pretty good, um, a little earthy, if you ask me. Um, Kevin, I worry so, about you now. I worry. <laughs> <laughs> My kids don't necessarily agree with that, but um, <laughs> the point is that, you know, if it's, you have a strong ammonia odor, you have a strong rancid odor, something's wrong, you know, it most likely has gone anaerobic and needs some aeration uh, to reintroduce all that microorganism activity, okay? So you're going, our general um, recommendation is you're going to have equal volumes of greens and browns. So you have a big old pile of your greens over here and a big pile of the browns over here and you want them in equal volumes, right? And so in the classes that I teach for the Master Gardeners, I usually use the visual of a five gallon bucket. So if you fill up a five gallon bucket with greens, that is going to be so heavy and dense because the greens have so much water in them, right? And so there's going to be very little air in that five-gallon bucket, whereas the browns are going to have all this air in there, and it's not really going to be equal volume. So you really have to stuff that five-gallon bucket of browns full to the brim until you can't fit any in there, and then you would have squeezed all the air out, and you have roughly equal volumes of greens and browns. And the research backs us up that if you are going using equal volumes, you are generally getting a good mix of materials to do hot composting, okay? So equal volumes of greens and browns, ideally chopped up as much as possible. The ultimate pile at the very least, three by three by three, but that's 27 cubic feet, but it can be much bigger, okay? Obviously at municipal compost areas, they have huge windrows that are 100 yards long, right? So it can be much bigger, but it has to have a minimum size. Turn it once a week is the general recommendation, and the moisture is what's so important. Because if you do not keep that um, pile moist, and it starts to air on the side of too dry, the decomposition process kind of grinds to a halt. Okay, so keeping that moisture at kind of that not too wet, not too dry Goldilocks level um, is so important. Okay, and so that's why I always tell people when they're building the pile to make sure you have a hose there and you're 
moistening it as you go. If you build the pile and then you try and moisten it, it, it doesn't work very well for those brown materials. They don't, they don't get adequately moist. Um, so if you make this pile and you turn it once a week and you're monitoring the moisture well, it is very possible that you could have a finished batch of compost in eight weeks. So this is something where, you know, you build it, you manage it, and you harvest it. You're not continually adding to it, right? You're, I always say you treat it like a batch, okay? And so you see that batch through and you harvest it, and you get a decent amount of compost from each of these batches in a decent amount of time. Now, a lot of people say, well, but what about the stuff that I am continually producing while that batch is cooking, which is why when I always say, that's why you need two compost piles, right? So you have a cold pile maybe or a worm bin or something and you have this hot compost. Again, this is for people who have, number one, the motivation to do this, number two, have a large volume of organic materials, and number three, probably have a big need for compost, okay? So we're gonna move on from here. How am I doing on time? Um, we are we are 40 minutes and you're doing great we we do have a question um about like i'm i'm physically limited and can't turn uh their mm -hmm. compost pile so this wouldn't be for them so we'd pick something else right yes i would say so because the the they do have some new tools like a compost aerator which is kind of a a tool that you stick into the um to the pile and pull it out to aerate it but it still takes some some physical exertion to do that. There is a attachment that can go onto a drill and it's like an enormous drill bit. And a lot of people will use a power tool, believe it or not, a drill with an enormous uh, auger on it bit, but they're very big to drill into their piles and aerate them that way. Again, that does take some strength to be able to do that. There yeah. are the compost tumblers, which a lot of people will, um, kind of choose because of the ease of turning them. However, in my experience for hot composting, I, I just, I am not convinced that it's a good option. Um, so I would kind of agree with you, Lauren, that if they are not able to turn, they may want to consider one of these other systems that we're going to move on to now. Perfect. Thank you. So cold composting. Now, um, as you can see in this picture, this gentleman is, um, He's thinking deeply about this compost <laughs> and whether or not this is the right system that he chose, right? So interestingly, a lot of the commercial compost bins are odd in the sense that they're shaped like volcanoes for some reason, and I've never figured out why. Um, but a lot of these compost bins are wider at the bottom and get narrower at the top, which doesn't lend itself to easy turning, right? <laughs> Imagine trying to stick a pitchfork in there or a, a digging fork and turn that, right? It, it gets a little frustrating. So, you know, that's something to consider when buying a compost bin. Of course, you don't even need a compost bin. You can have an open pile. But compost bins tend to be nice for aesthetic reasons and to kind of keep the pile managed and also keep critters out, okay? So a cold composting system, when would this work for people? Well, this is for a situation where your need of finished compost isn't that great, okay? So you want compost, but you don't need so much where you need to, you know, seek out all the materials needed to do hot composting. So you're just adding materials to a compost pile as they become available from your kitchen, from your yard, whatever, okay? But here is the ultimate tip for cold composting, I guarantee it. You cannot dump and run, okay? So this gentleman right now, he's, well, he's not running yet, but he's dumping. <laughs> and my guess is he's gonna dump and then he's gonna run away, okay? And this happens all the time. And I see it all the time when I go out and see compost piles where people are struggling, they're usually full of just greens, just dumped kitchen scraps in pile after pile after pile and what, ends up happening is a stinky, messy, maggot infested pile of disgusting grossness. <laughs> so in order to avoid that situation, which then leads to people saying, well, I, composting doesn't work for me or I can't do it. And then they stop doing it. 
the key is you still adhere to the equal volumes of greens and browns, even though you're doing cold composting. So this means that when you go out there with that little bucket and you're going to dump, you don't run away yet. You bend down and you have a little bin or you have a bit full of dried leaves or shredded paper or you have a straw bale sitting next to your compost bin. Um, whatever brown material that is easy for you to have on hand, you want to utilize even when you're cold composting. So you dump the greens in, guess what? Then you're gonna cover them with the brown material in roughly the equal volume of what you just dumped in green-wise, right? That means that your pile will maintain those equal volumes as it grows and grows, grows and grows. And of course, the moisture is still super important, okay? But if you're doing cold composting, usually a lot of your um, materials are, are, are these food scraps, and those food scraps have a ton of moisture in them. So many times, you know, it, it's a pile can be too wet as opposed to too dry. But you really never, ever, ever want to let a backyard compost pile dry out because once you do, it becomes a home for something. Okay, so up in the foothills here, I've heard of rattlesnakes moving into dried out compost piles, rats, um, you know, other critters, um, obviously ants, ant nests, wasps. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different things that will move in to a dried out pile of brush. Okay, so um, you do not want to do that. You don't want to let it dry out. So you always want to err on the side of wet rather than dry. Now, here's the interesting thing about cold composting. You do get finished compost, but where is it? It's at the bottom, right? So for years and years, I tried to understand what that little door, that little <laughs> flap at the bottom of the compost bin was for. I was like, what? Why would you need to go open, have a little door down there, right? So of course then, you know, I realized that, okay, that's where the compost is if you're doing cold composting and you're not going to dump out the whole pile because there's a bunch of raw material still in there. And so you have this little door that you maybe every week can go out, open up and get your little trowel and you get your little trowel of compost per week, right? So be aware, does cold composting work? Sure, but it's going to take a a lot more time than hot composting, and you're not going to produce a large volume of finished compost at one time. You're going to get small amounts over a long period of time. That may be just fine, no problem at all. So again, what's your goal? How much material do you have? Maybe you don't even need to venture into hot composting. Cold composting might work perfect for you. Okay, great. Okay, before I um, start. Oh, I'm doing pretty good on time. Okay, I'm going to move on. So let's talk about worms. So, so far we've talked about strictly backyard composting, right? You either have a hot compost pile in your backyard or a cold compost in your backyard. Um, this worm composting, this system is, is very different because even though it involves greens and browns, it's not mixing greens and browns and trying to grow microorganisms to, um, you know, decompose all that material. This is literally putting worms into a home and feeding them and making sure the conditions in there are just perfect for them so that they can process the organic materials. And once again, talking about poop, goes out the other end and worm poop has a fancy name, worm castings, okay? And so these worm castings are probably the best soil amendment on the face of the earth. Um, so it's definitely a worthwhile um, venture to try worm composting, even if you're doing hot composting and cold composting. But worm composting is generally kind of marketed at folks who don't have that outdoor area, right? So folks that maybe live in an apartment and just have a balcony and can have a worm bin out on that balcony to recycle their, their food scraps. Um, so again, Depending on your situation and depending on your goal, a worm bin may suffice. You may not even need a backyard compost pile because this would work for you, okay, depending on how much you, food scraps you produce. 
I give uh, compost talks up in Tahoe um, here and there. And I always tell folks up there that uh, because it's bear country and because bears will get into a compost bin with food scraps, guaranteed, I always tell people it's good to have an outdoor pile for your yard waste and then an indoor worm bin for your food scraps. That way, the yard waste pile isn't attractive to the bear, but you're still able to recycle those food scraps through the worm bin indoors or in your laundry room and garage, whatever, right? So sometimes mixing two systems because of a situation of a critter, like a bear, um, makes the most sense as well, okay? So in this case, in a worm bin, you'll see three pictures there. And I want to... I want to make sure to say there's not necessarily one way to do worm composting. Again, it depends on how much material you need to recycle through the worms. So you'll see the little Rubbermaid bins up, up top there. Um, and we use those bins to teach, usually in schools, uh, to teach kids about composting and worms and things like that. So this is those bins are a very inexpensive DIY way to make a worm bin. You buy a couple bins, you shred a bunch of uh, paper, which is the brown material, which serves as their bedding. And so that bedding goes into the bottom of the bin and gets thoroughly moistened, okay? So it's nice and moist, like a wrung out sponge. And then you add red worms. There's a specific type of worm called the red wiggler that um, is used for worm composting. There's other worms as well, but, um, I generally focus on red wigglers because they tend to be the most forgiving <laughs> worm as far as temperature and moisture fluctuations and hardiness. So anyway, red wigglers are the way to go. Definitely the way to start if you've never done worm composting. So you'll see some bedding in there in the, in the bottom of the bin and you add your worms and then you would add food scraps on top. And over time, the worms munch on the food scraps and, and poop out castings and over a period of time, the bin gets filled with castings and the, the bedding starts to disappear and you need to harvest the castings. So harvesting the castings is regularly, it's very, very important. But let's say that DIY system would work for maybe, you know, I would say a person living by themselves, maybe two people in a household, but above, above two people, um, eating a lot of vegetables and drinking a lot of coffee, you're probably going to need a larger worm composting system. So I usually say the DIY bins are kind of like a starter unit or a, a low volume unit, and you can move up. You can scale it up. Okay, so the, the other picture down below to the left, you'll see that it has levels. It's a stackable worm composting system. And there's lots of these on the market. There's a bunch of them. Um, and it's a really slick system that allows you to keep adding food scraps and move the worms up a level each time they finish transforming the materials into castings. And it makes it easy to harvest the castings because unlike the DIY bin up there, up at the top, where you have to figure out a way to separate the worms from the castings, in these systems, it's already kind of done for you by the nature of the, of the system, okay? So those stackable um, worm composting systems work. Um, same considerations, you still put bedding into them, you still have to put worms into them, you still have to manage the moisture, all those things. Um, but they allow you to do more volume and harvest the castings easier. Now, you wanna level up from there, there, there are, there's another type of worm composting systems uh, system that is based on these bio bags. And these are huge bags that breathe. Um, usually they're made of really high quality materials like Gore-Tex or something like that. Lightweight, strong, durable, yet they breathe. And these are really cool. And this is pretty much what I've moved to personally. Um, so there's a number of them on the market again. And what you'll see is you still put bedding in the bottom of that bag and you still put the worms in and you're still, you know, maintaining moisture and feeding on the top. Okay. Cause in nature, that's where the worms feed. They don't, you don't shove the food down into the worms. They come up and eat it. Okay. And so um, over time, the, the bag system is kind of nice because if you can't really see in the picture, but in the bottom, there's a little compartment that has a zipper 
and you unzip that zipper and castings fall out the bottom. So you don't have to separate the worms from the castings. You just can just open up the bottom. Sure, a few worms fall out, but you can just put them back in the top. Um, it actually works much better than I thought it would, to be honest with you. Um, so this is kind of referred to as an in-vessel system, meaning that there's no separation um, involved. You're, you, once you put the bedding and the worms in, and you're feeding on top, it becomes this perpetual system where you're constantly feeding and you can harvest out of the bottom. So those can handle a tremendous volume of food scraps. So not only do you have a choice to do worm compost and you have a choice at what scale you do it, and this isn't even the top scale. There's still another level of actually doing an outdoor huge worm bin. I actually learned about worm composting at a place in uh, um, a place at UC Berkeley uh, where students were, were running a, a worm farm where they were using old dumpsters as huge worm bins. So just to give you an idea of scale there in that sense, right? Probably a million worms in, in one of those. So moving on. Oh, wait, Kevin, this is yeah. amazing. You've answered so many questions just by, just by keeping talking, but we got a lot of questions that are asking, um, uh, how do I know when it's time to harvest castings in my worm bin? And I mean, like you just went through this whole thing on scale and size. So, I mean, if there's a million worms, that's a lot of <laughs> worm poop. So truly like, how do you, how do you know? Like, yeah. And, and, and for the, for the systems like the stackable one and the bag, I mean, you literally just like pull off the level and look at it, right? Or the bag, you open up the bottom and see what comes out. I mean, that's just, you're just checking, you know, with your eyes basically, right? Um, whereas the bin, you can actually feel the change occur. It gets a lot heavier when the castings build up at the bottom of those DIY bins. It literally gets so heavy where you can barely lift the thing. Um, Another thing that happens is the worms don't like to live in their own castings. And so once you see the bedding disappear and you're actually just looking down and seeing food on top of castings, you know it's time to harvest that thing. And there's a general recommendation for those DIY bins that you harvest them at least three times a year. So if you literally just got into a habit of every four months doing just harvesting your bin, then that would probably work out well um some people dump out those bins on a tarp and just let the worms go down out of the light and you harvest the castings off what is on the top now but was on the bottom um and some people will start feeding only on one side of the bin and move the worms over there and harvest the other side put fresh bedding start feeding over there and move them back over there so they harvest it over time um they actually have these diy worm harvest harvesters on YouTube that you can check out where you make a, a spinning thing out of a five gallon bucket and put all the worms and the castings in there. And amazingly, it, it shoots the worms out of one side and the castings fall through the screen. It's, it's crazy. Um, so anyway, the point is that there's a lot of different ways to find out when it's time to harvest, but you could also kind of just go by every couple months, harvest your, your castings. That will keep your worm bin as healthy as possible. Okay. And Kevin, I mean, where do you yeah. buy your new pets? Where do you buy your red wigglers? Like, is there a worm dealer somewhere? Is there oh, yeah. like, I there's mean, do you have to name these dealers. pets? Okay, there's worms in the world, people. There's people out yeah, there selling know, worms. <laughs> we have worm farms dotted throughout uh, California. Um, and you can actually buy them online and have them mailed to you, shipped to you. Um, and we usually recommend starting out a worm bin with, you know, half pound to a pound of worms. Um, and, and the price has gone up quite a bit on worms, um, over, over the last, you know, 10 years or so, but you can generally get a pound of worms for about 30 to $40. Um, and once you have them, you can then start new bins from your existing stock, if you will, because once, if you remove a bunch of worms from an existing worm bin without removing all of them, those worms will breed and repopulate that worm bin. And they kind of come to a point where their population is stable. So they don't overpopulate. If everything is perfect in the bin, they don't keep breeding and 
come out the sides of your bin. Don't worry about that. Okay. So I can become <laughs> a worm farmer and a worm composter at the same time. This is amazing. I'm going to double yep. down with that. Um, yep. A lot of people are questioning what type of paper to put in. And we have a lot of people going back and forth about what's good and what's bad in the paper. But can you just give us like, mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I treat my new uh, farmed worms uh, the best? Like what's the best paper I should be using for my, my, new, my new friends? You know, in general, I like to use newspaper just because it breaks down pretty fast. I like to either strip, make it into long spaghetti strips or run it through a shredder that makes those long strips. It, it makes, it keeps air in the bedding so that the worms, it doesn't go anaerobic in, in there, which you would know because it would start to smell bad. Okay. Um, so newspaper is an option. We usually recommend avoiding the glossy um, inserts and things like that. Um, because it's, it has a varnish on it that may harm the worms. It's not clear if it does or not, so we just avoid it. But even like office paper, you know, most ink now from printers is soy-based inks. So you can pretty much get away with all paper. I would just avoid glossy stuff. Okay, perfect. And I have one more question for you on worms, just because um, I have to say that I've actually babysat someone's worm bin when they went on oh. vacation. So this is what about caring for worms during absences? I travel a lot, so I dump my worms into my compost bins when when I'll be gone for a while. So, I mean, get a babysitter. I babysat worms. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I charge quite a bit by the hour to baby to worm sit. <laughs> um, you know, I, amazingly, you know, my farm advisor used to say, worm bins work well with benign neglect <laughs> and of course that's an exaggeration but the point is that you the more you mess with the worm bin the more problems you may have the best thing to do is to set it up figure out the moisture figure out the, the, the amount to feed which you have to figure out yourself because if you just overload it with a bunch of food that's not a good thing you want to feed in small amount and see how long it takes for that to disappear and that helps you guide you to how much you should be feeding and how much that system can handle. Um, so, you know, there, you know, it's, it's, it's not, there's no um, hard science, I guess, to it. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. You feel your way through with worm composting. So Great. I'm going to move you, on Kevin. now to Bokashi composting. I'm getting more and more questions about this. Um, so my phone line at my work is called the rot line. It's a composting hotline. So the master gardeners have a hotline and my line is called the rot line that has to do with some funding we had in the past and things like that. And so I get a lot of composting questions and a lot of weird ones um, <laughs> and have for 18 years. And I've noticed that more and more questions are coming up about Bokashi. And so Bokashi is a unique composting system. Okay, this is different than a backyard compost pile, different than a worm compost pile. This is a system of feeding microbes, to put it bluntly. So what you're doing is see the little picture of the bucket there. You're putting your food scraps into a bucket and you're adding that little bag there. It, you can't really see what it says on there, but it says EM. And EM stands for effective microorganisms. And this was a technique that was created um, to de to ferment food scraps um, anaerobically, not using oxygen. So, I mean, this is so different than what we've talked about thus far. Basically, you're putting your food scraps, and believe it or not, even meat and dairy can go in a Bokashi system, which is attractive to a lot of people because we, we don't recommend putting meat and dairy in a backyard pile or a worm bin. So this allows you to at least um, deal with those uh, materials. So you put them in this bucket and then you sprinkle this bran. It's usually some sort of rice bran or some people use spent uh, beer making grains. And it's those grains, whatever the substrate, they're inoculated with these microorganisms. And so when you sprinkle the bran onto the food scraps into in the bucket and you put that little um, top on the top, so the bottom little screen actually goes on the bottom so that liquid can, can drain through. And then the solid green top goes on the top of the bucket. And when you seal it, there's no air. So it's anaerobic. So these organisms are 
functioning in an environment of low oxygen to no oxygen, which normally means to us, uh oh, that's not good because of odors. But in this case, because you're inoculating this material with a bunch of these microorganisms, it starts a fermentation process that, yes, has a little bit of an odor, but it's not necessarily a, a really putrid odor. Okay. It's a fermentation type odor. So, what this means is that this is not technically composting in the sense that it's fermentation. Okay. So, you're not, your end product isn't finished compost, it's a fermented product that then, when you add to your soil, still needs to be broken down by the organisms in the soil. But what the science has shown is that Bokashi compost, which is what it's called, specifically Bokashi compost, when you add it to the soil, it does appear to interest a lot of microorganisms and you know, nurture and sustain high microbial populations in the soil. So there does appear to be some good research in using this fermented end product in our gardens, okay? So even though this is not traditional composting, it's still always called composting, so I thought it was important to talk about. This type of system may work for somebody, again, who's, you know, if you're one person living alone, this may be all you need to, to process, to recycle um, your organic materials and meat and dairy. So Bokashi is something that I don't know a lot about. I don't have a lot of personal experience using it, so I probably can't answer a lot of questions on it. But I think it's worthwhile to start exploring. Okay. Okay. And we get to our final one. This is uh, related to the question earlier, trench composting. Um, this is a really interesting one because in the whole United States, it is absolutely 100% illegal to bury garbage, right? <laughs> I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, so you're not supposed to bury your garbage in your okay. backyard. Right? Okay, but remember, garbage is a term that refers to a lot of stuff and not yeah. just organic materials. So actually burying organic materials by themselves appears to be approved by most counties. Okay, so for example, that graphic in the on the top there, is actually from the city of Davis. And on their davisrecycling.org site, where they talk about ways of composting, this is a recommended way to recycle your organic materials. And that is to bury them in a hole at least 12 inch deep and cover with soil and give it time. And over time, they break down in, in that space, right? And so um, you'll see the bottom picture is more related to the actual term of trench composting, which is digging a big trench and adding materials over time and kind of continuing that around your yard so that where you start the trench is going to break down much faster than the stuff you're adding later, right? And so it's a process, it's kind of a perpetual system. Um, and so trench composting works, but it takes time. So as you can imagine, you're not necessarily doing equal volumes of eat greens and browns here. This is more of a system to deal with food scraps, right? Um, in some cases, maybe animal manure, okay? So it's going to take time for those materials to break down. And the issue with bearing organic materials and the amount of time they take to get eaten up is that other critters will come and visit <laughs> in, in the meantime and potentially create some problems for you. So for example, I've had people tell me, well, I tried trench composting, but I also let my chickens free range. And, and as you can imagine, that was a disaster, right? So there was food scraps all over the place after one day. Um, so dogs um, love to dig in, you know, and go, what's that smell down there, right? Even though they might not be eating rotten corn, um, they're gonna dig it up and check it out. Um, Raccoons, other uh, critters will likely visit and because they have, they're smelling that odor that's produced from this uh, type of composting. And so it's possible you may have some critter issues with this method. Um, and 
I have to be honest with you. I, I tend to think that if, you know, 30 million people in California went in their backyard and okay, maybe not 30 million, 20 million, uh, <laughs> buried, buried their organic materials in their backyard, there ha- would have to be an impact, I would think, potential impact on our groundwater, right? I mean, the reason why we it's illegal to bury garbage is groundwater protection. So I would also think that if we did trench composting large scale, um, in a sense, we could also be putting our groundwater at jeopardy. This is why in a landfill, the landfill is lined and the leachate, the drainage that goes through a landfill is captured and taken off site and treated, not discharged into our groundwater. So that same principle should hold true for trench composting. I don't think it's a big deal, of course, in a small scale, but I tend to not recommend this because I, I think, gosh, what if, Everyone was doing this and burying stuff in their backyards. Uh, with how many people we have here in California, I worry that that, that could become a problem. Um, so it's an option. You can experiment with it. It There's research on it. Um, it does show that as far as improvement to the soil, you know, it, there is improvement. There is heightened microbial activity, obviously, heightened worm activity, obviously, and that leads to more nutrients and organic matter in your soil. So something to consider. So we've gone through all these different systems. Which one is going to work for you? That's what you got to figure out. So here's the list of materials that you want to avoid putting in your pile, but I want to be crystal clear. I'm wearing my UC Master Gardener hat when I when I'm saying this. So you may talk to people that say, oh, I've, I've you know, composted meat and fish scraps without any problem. Or I've, I throw, you know, my uh, disease-infected tomato plants in there, no problem. So I'm not saying that these things won't decompose. I'm saying the University of California Master Gardener Program does not recommend putting these in your pile because we want you to succeed. That's basically why. And these can lead to problems. So quickly, disease-infected plants, if you don't have a humming hot compost pile, those diseases could potentially persist and be spread to your gardens when you move the compost. So that's why we say don't put diseased plants in there. Plants with a bunch of, you know, pest insects on there. We say don't take the risk. Don't put them in there. What if they survive? What if they breed? And what if they come back into your garden with a vengeance, right? Plants that propagate themselves from pieces of themselves, like succulents and and Bermuda grass from rhizomes and ivy and anything that has a structure that's going to propagate in a compost pile, you don't want to put in there, right? Because the compost pile will become overrun with that plant. Okay, so avoid those. Now, a lot of people will dry those out, put them on a tarp in the hot sun and dry those things out till they're dust (laughs) and, you know, add them into a pile as a brown material. I would say that's definitely doable, except for Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass, you can think is totally dead and somehow it it resurrects into the the most monster, basically. Um, So avoid Bermuda grass into your compost pile at all costs. Um, cat and dog manures, again, wearing my UC hat, we do not recommend putting those in a compost pile. I know lots of people do, but there is the potential for pathogens in that those manures to transfer to yourself. And so to be cautious and to not take that risk, we don't avoid, we don't recommend putting them in there. Um, meat and fish scraps, Basically, that's just because you're going to get critters <laughs> visiting and you're going to get odors. So most people don't want either of those problems, right? Um, wood ash is an interesting one. It used to be, you'll read books on composting, um, you know, it go back 20 to 30 years ago, and they recommend putting wood ash in your compost pile, whereas now the recommendation is to only add wood ash to finish compost and not to a cooking compost pile because there is a chemical reaction that can occur where ash can turn into lye um, and be caustic. And so, and again, these are cautions. These are things that can get in the way of your success. So 
avoid them, okay? Now, last slide, using finished compost. In general, the, the, it depends on whether you're growing an annual or a perennial, how you incorporate compost into your garden. So for example, if you have a vegetable garden and you've prepped the bed and you're gonna grow an annual vegetable in there, then you kind of want to incorporate some of the compost into the actual bed. So maybe you put our recommendation is two to three inches of compost, okay, every time you turn over a crop, okay, unless your soil analysis says you have way too much organic matter. That would be the only reason why you would stop adding compost. Um, so if you're growing an annual, it has a small window of time living in that garden bed and a very small amount of roots to get nutrients and water. So you kind of want to incorporate the compost in the top th three to four inches of the soil so that the good stuff is in the root zone for that small window of time for the annual, right? Whereas a perennial that you've planted and it's going to live there for a while, all you need to do is top dress those two to three inches of compost on top. And through the action of irrigation and microbial activity and worm activity, it will find its way down into the soil, okay? So incorporation in general is for annual type situations, top dressing, because we wanna disturb the soil as least, you know, as little as possible, um, top dressing works for those perennial situations or shrubs or fruit trees or ornamental trees, those types of things. Some people are mixing homemade compost into these, um, into, container mixes. So you go out, you buy a potting soil. Well, some of that potting soil um, may not have adequate amount of organic matter in it as far as high quality compost goes. And so mixing a little bit in there can be beneficial to your uh, potted plants, your containers. And so a lot of times I'll do this when I'm, I have a container that is growing a perennial. I'll just top dress with compost, right? Um, and that helps even though the the, the organic matter has been exhausted a little bit and the container's dropping a little bit, maybe on a back-to-back -back year, it's not enough to necessitate you pulling the whole thing out and replenishing the soil so you can just top dress and get away with it. And, and then in the future, at some point, you likely have to take it out and add more potting soil and replant it because um, you don't want to bury the crown too much in compost, right? Um, propagation mixes. So in general, the recommendation is to use kind of a sterile mix. You know, vermiculite, perlite, peat is a common propagation mix for starting seeds, for taking cuttings, things like that. More and more research is being done on adding a little bit of compost to those propagation mixes, adding a little bit of nutrition, a little bit of biology. And so far, what I've reviewed, um, it looks like you get good results from that. Of course, the fear is that by adding some of that biology, you may be adding some pathogens that could harm those early seedlings or those cuttings from, from getting established. But I think moving forward that more and more research is going to lead us in that direction of adding a little bit of nutrition and biology to these propagation mixes. And then finally, compost extracts and teas. I kind of do a whole, again, a whole class on this, but in general, again, wearing my UC Master Gardener hat, what we recommend is using compost extracts, but not necessarily brewing compost teas. So um, extracts are simply mixing finished compost with some water, stirring it up, extracting the soluble nutrients out of the compost, and pouring that liquid around your plants. So in a sense, you can think of it as a, a, a low-potency uh, liquid fertilizer. It's just extracting the soluble nutrients out. Whereas brewing compost tea is a completely different thing. That is growing microorganisms. And there isn't a lot of good peer-reviewed replicated research saying that doing that is worthwhile, uh, to be honest. So even though I do teach master gardeners about compost tea so they know what it is because people um, are doing this and they ask us questions about it, the UC recommendation is to use the extracts, but don't waste the time doing the brewing of teas um, because the research just hasn't shown it to be worthwhile yet. So those are some ways to use compost, finished compost in your garden.
And there's my Rotline phone number and my email. And Lauren warned me that I'm publicizing my email. And I said, I yeah. Did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm, did. I'm fine I did. with that. I'm fine with taking questions. This is like my my passion. So I can talk compost all day. I could probably go for another couple hours if you're if you're willing. I, I am not willing, Kevin. I am not willing. However, it seems like everyone in the audience is definitely willing. Uh, we're up to 348 people all talking about compost. And although, Kevin, you can't see the comments, um, everyone's been helping each other. It's been amazing. I'm going to remove your presentation screen right now. Uh, we are going to drop in the chat how to um, contact your local UC Master Gardener program to learn a little bit about more about composting if you need it. So many questions, so many great answers going back and forth. And Kevin, I do have to say that every time questions came up, like a minute and a half later, you were answering the questions. It felt so good. You're just naturally like all over in it without even knowing. So thank you so much for that. Um, I I will say that that you that you do have like some fans out there. We uh, you can see on the screen we have great presentation. Um, so there are people that are going to be fanning about you and fanning <laughs> about composting. So we really do appreciate everyone in the comments helping each other out, being kind. We really uh, we really love that uh, we had one of our master gardener coordinators, Marcy Souza, online. She was helping out, giving people uh, little tidbits of information. So Marcy. Marcy, thank you for that. Uh, oh, look at this nice comment. Kevin, people love you. This is amazing. Oh, that, worms, oh. that, that worms my heart. That warms your heart. Kevin, I do have to say, I wrote down two things. Um, I am I may be soon the proud owner of some red red worms. So thank you very much. Some red wigglers. And I didn't know I could own microbes and have them work for me in my own yeah. yard. You, you just laid down a bunch of science. I may become a microbe farmer, a worm farmer. There's so many things I can do. And uh, sadly enough, as you talked, I'm like, oh, that's why my compost pile didn't work. Oh, that's yeah. why it didn't work. Oh, that's why I have ants. Oh, that's why I had rats. Oh, that's why I had this. Um, and Kevin, I do not have a water source close enough to my compost pile. Mm. Thank you very much. That's the one thing I will remedy before I start this yeah. project again. And uh, I, by the way, you said uh, you have seven acres. I just pictured compost piles everywhere now. <laughs> I just, you are now a compost farmer in my mind. Yeah. Um, so when I picture you anywhere, you will definitely be, uh, be out uh, working with compost, wearing a headlamp, having a really good time <laughs> up in Nevada County. Uh, we have- You weren't supposed to give away my, my <laughs> headlamp. Uh, forays out into my compost pile, but yeah. Hey man, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> the, the time's going to change soon. So you're going to have to wear it almost all the time. So mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of thank yous coming in and Kevin, we do thank you for joining us for the 2020 virtual conference. This is a, it's a new step forward for us. And this isn't the last, this is uh, only our fourth one and you're doing a great job. Everyone's getting the hang of participating and everyone you can tune in at noon today to learn more about our search for excellence, which is basically a uh, competitive process where our master gardener programs send in their projects to be judged and um, then awarded with prizes. So we have our search for Excellence winners from San Diego County who are going to be talking about their project at noon. Uh, we are just excited to have so many people on. This is all recorded. So if you missed something, go back. If you missed Kevin's information, it's a minute ago. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and close out our room. People are still commenting. You are, you have your own fan club, Kevin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope you compost me. Yes, happy composting everyone and hopefully Kevin you have um you have uh, achieved your goal today and started new composters. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye.